Hello, and welcome to Zim Explore, where we're going to take a look at uh, many of the things that we can do with Zim. So this is the second Zim Explore. Let's uh, go into Zim now at zimjs.com, and we will reduce our Explore soundtrack. Oh, and go into the code. We copied the template the last time. And what we're going to do is we're just going to go into that uh, code that we were working with last time. You can pop on back to the first Explorer and see that if you want to start from the beginning. Let's have a look and see what we had made. We open this in a browser. All right, we had a blob that we were moving around. And these all got remembered in their positions with the Zim Transform and the Zim Transform Manager. And we threw a dial on there to just remind you that we have more than just shapes. Great. So let's um, uh, just work on something else. So I'm going to go in and we're going to comment out the stuff that we were working with before all the way up to the circle. And we will just center the circle. We'll put a dot drag on there as well. Dot drag like so. So we've got a circle centered on the stage and let's have a look. Now I think we had that open already. There it is. And refresh. There's our circle, draggable on the stage. Okay, now let's let's animate. So we will say dot animate, and we pass in the properties that we want to animate. So this is called an animation object, and we will say the scale to two. We'll make it twice as big. Next parameter is how long, so that's uh, the time, we'll say 100 milliseconds. So that's one second, we will make it twice as big. So we save that and we refresh here. There it goes. One second, it goes twice as big. We can make that rewind, go backwards, but the rewind parameter is something like the tenth parameter, so we would have to go null, comma, null, comma, null, et cetera, to, to get to that tenth parameter, because the third parameter is the, the easing, the type of easing that we're going to use, and then there's uh, a callback, and then a wait, and then so forth. There's a whole bunch of things in here, a bunch of parameters. So it becomes really unmanageable. As a matter of fact, there are 30 parameters or so for animate. And if we had to remember the order of them, that's difficult and so forth. So what we can do is instead, we can use a configuration object. So we're going to start this off as an object. It's a little bit confusing with animate because we've got an object within an object. But uh, our configuration object, the two squiggly brackets on the outside, this one and this one, needs property names. So the name of this one is obj. The name of this one is time. And then if we want to rewind, the name of that one is rewind. So these are the names of the parameters. So we put the name of the parameter as, as outlined in the documents, documentation, a colon, and then the value that we want for that parameter. So the time is 100 and the rewind is true. Z, isn't that nice? That's pretty simple. <clears throat> so we'll save that up and we'll view it in a browser. Excuse me. <coughs> and refresh. And now it rewinds back to the beginning. We might want to loop that, and so it becomes quite simple. Loop colon true. If you can spell true, you can do it. So there we are. We're animating our circle. We're scaling it. The reason why this is like this, well, let's just see the loop first. <coughs> Excuse me. It gets bigger, smaller. And there she is looping. And we can do loop weights and rewind weights and loop calls and rewind calls and so forth. So animation is very powerful in Zim. Now, isn't that nice looking? I mean, I've done animations in CSS. I've done animations for many, many years. And I look at the CSS animations, they just go, oh, God, they're like twice as long, if not more. And just a mess of words, unbelievable. So the animations are fine. It's just uh, it'd be nicer if they had a, a better sort of interface into them or API. <clears throat> okay. 
Uh, let's see, that's animating. Now, one thing is when we drag, drag by default will um, will stop this animation from happening. So I can pick it up right now. And as I drag, that animation is no longer happening. Many of the animations are positioned. Oh, wanted to show you that. The, the object here, the scaling or the uh, animation object can also animate, say, position. So we could go with X. Well, this animation object can animate any project, uh, any property of the uh, circle. So here we're animating X and we'll make that go to something like 800. And now it will animate the scale and the position to 800 as we go. We can make that relative, say if we go minus 200 uh, or minus 300, and we can put quotes around that to make it relative. So now it will move relative from its current place, current value, 300 over. So it's not animating to minus 300, which would be off stage. <clears throat> so we can animate any number of things in here, and that's why we put an object here as a value, so that we can specify a bunch of properties that we might want to animate, and we call that the animation object. It does make it look a touch more complex because we've got an object within an object, but really it's not that bad once you get used to it. It's actually good practice for working with nested objects. <laughs> look at it that way. All right, so we're animating a scale, just uh, just the scale now. We're rewinding and we're looping. But what I was going to tell you, though, is drag. If we pick that up, it stops. So we saw that. Um, and the reason for it is, is often we animate the location of something and yet we want to pick it up. We don't want to keep on trying to animate to a location while we're trying to drag it. Those two would fight against one another and kind of go back and forth and look jittery. So what we've done in Zim is decided to make drag automatically turn off animation. So what we would want to do with drag is if, if we did want it to still scale while we did that, we can say um, remove tweens colon false. So by default, removing the tweens, drag will remove the tweens by default. Note that we went right to this parameter of drag. Drag also has many parameters, such as the rectangle, uh, whether you want it to come up on top, a variety of things like that. And we've gone directly to one way down the line called remove tweens, and we've said, please don't remove the tweens when I drag. And we refresh there. And now we can pick it up, and it still remains tweening as we drag it around. So, fine, let's just, uh, well, we'll leave the animate on there, but what I did want to show you now is a bit about tiling. So, we've got a circle. We won't even put it on the stage. We'll just uh, make a circle, that's it. <clears throat> and down below, we can say var tile. We may not even need to add it to a variable. Let's just make a new tile new tile. Oh, we will. We'll have to put an event on it later. So var tile is equal to a new tile. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a bit of a cold out here in space as we explore. Luckily, I have some water. So there's a new tile. <coughs> uh, we would say, please tile the circle. And then how many columns? Maybe eight. And how many rows? How about five? Might want to make this a little bit smaller too if we're going to tile it. Fifty. And we'll center that on the stage. So we save that up and let's have a look at our tile. There is the circle. It's been cloned to tile on the stage. And now we can animate um, some things. Uh, we can animate this by, well, let's just copy our animate from up above. Copy this. Place it here. Comment it. Now this is going to scale the whole tile, which isn't really what we want to do yet. So there it is, scaling the whole tile from its registration point. And now uh, let's just comment out the animation for a second, talk a bit more about registration point. So we'll dot outline this. 
This one's a, a touch awkward. It's not the end of the world, but there's its bounding box. Its registration point happens to be right here. And when we tiled the circles, we tiled them, the circles get placed at their registration point. So that's zero, zero within the tile. That's also the registration point. So it's only a bit awkward because the circle's making it kind of go off the edge as well. But anyway, what's happening is we're scaling it from its registration point right there. We might rather scale it from the center of, of this. So that means we'd want to be able to place the registration point on the center. The easiest way to do that is with a, another way that we can add things to the stage with center reg. So that centers the registration point and centers it on the stage. So if we refresh now, you'll see that the circle has moved to the middle. That means its registration points in the center. And when it scales, it will scale from the registration point. Shall we see that? So we'll comment out the outline and we'll bring back the animate. Save that and refresh here. Now the whole grid is scaling from its registration point there in the center. By the way, there's also dot reg, which will allow you to set whatever registration points you want, both in the X and in the Y, but uh, we're not going to do that at the moment. Now, I don't even really want to animate the whole tile. What I want to show you is a sequence animation. So if we animate, if we take a, a container, we can animate everything in the container in a sequence by going comma sequence colon. And then we say how long between each one do we want to wait. And what this will do is it will animate each circle like this, but one second, or sorry, 100 milliseconds after uh, the one that it's just animated. So let's see what this does. Now for this to be seen properly, I think we should put a border on the, so this is the border uh, color right now, and we can go just a frame dot gray, for instance. And let's refresh what we've got. You ready? Ooh, isn't that neat? Aren't you glad we're exploring? So what this is doing is it's animating each object, each child of the container, of the tile, which is a container, in a sequence, like so. Neat, huh? Okay, let's turn the animation off there and talk about containers a little bit more. So tile is a container. Well, it's a tile class, but that extends a Zim container, which extends a CreateJS container, and containers have children. <coughs> containers work in magical ways, too. You can do something like this tile.on. So that's the on method, much like add event listener. Click, comma, function. Ooh, those cold hands. And in the function, missed, in the function, we will collect what's called an event object. So that's a parameter and we can name it whatever we want, but I tend to call this E. When we click on something, the on method will pass in extra information about the uh, object that we've clicked on or, you know, that kind of stuff or the event in general. One of that, of those things is the e.target. So e.target is the object that we've clicked on and we can set its alpha like this is equal to 0.2 for instance. We'll want to stage.update as well because this is happening after, uh, it happens when we click. This stage.update here only happens, only takes care of the stuff in the beginning. Later, once we click, we need another stage.update to show a change. You'll probably forget that. You won't see a change, you'll think it's broken. If you don't see a change, say, oh, maybe I have to update the stage. And that's how it's done. So what happens is e.target is what is actually clicked on, and we're going to set its alpha. So let's take a look. <clears throat> we click, and there it sets the alpha. Oh, we should show, we should indicate that we can click on this too. So let's just pop up here, and we will dot cur. So that adds a cursor. You can say what kind in CSS, but by default it will add a pointer. So that adds a pointer. Uh, this is one way to do alpha. The other way is with the chainable method, but we're not needing to chain at the moment. So. I don't have to chain, I usually just 
use the traditional property. Okay, but that that's a chainable way that we could set the map, the uh, alpha. So we'll go back to its traditional property. Oh, point one, point two was it? Yeah. Right. So that sets the uh, whatever was clicked on to point two. Do we see that happen? Oh, not without the. This doesn't have the cursor, so we refresh here. Uh, there's the finger, so now I know that we can do something here. Great, I can already feel a puzzle happening. Okay, the other thing, uh, another thing, there's other things as well, but another thing that the E has is a current target. It's a bad name, but whatever. E dot current target is whatever the event is placed on. So E dot current targets the container, it's tile. We put the event on tile, so current target is the whole tile. So now the whole tile will have its alpha changed. Click. Okay. So that's current target and target. Uh, those two things are important. Uh, another neat thing is if we let's well let's just comment that out. I suppose for now uh, we could say tile. Well, we'll do it up here. Tile dot cursor. Tile dot drag. As a matter of fact, if we dot drag, we don't need to do, put the cursor on there because the drag will automatically add a, a pointer cursor for you or any cursor you specify in the parameter for the cursor. There's an over cursor and there's a drag cursor. Note that we're able to comment out any of the chaining things that we've done and still chain inside. That's one nice thing about putting them on multiple lines is that you can comment out things if you want and the chaining still works. Now watch what happens. Ooh. Did you expect that? We put the drag on the tile, and now we can drag anything in the tile. Wow, that's pretty cool. Have a hundred monsters, and can drag by just saying monsters.drag. Now you may not want to do that, so there's a parameter of the, of the drag. Uh, let's just take a look at that again quickly. If I uh, I'll refresh, if I pick this one up, note that it's on top of all the others. Okay, but if I pick this one up, now this one's on top of all the others. That's also a parameter that's available for you to change. Let's just change that quickly. That's called the on top parameter. And we can set that to false, like so. And we refresh here. And now as I pick up, it no longer comes on top of the ones that were added after. So all these ones were added after this, therefore they're on top. All these ones were added before it, therefore they're underneath. So as you add, things go on top. Okay, that's the on top parameter, but we probably want that to be the default. Uh, another one we have is current target, like so, and we can set that to false. Now, have any guesses as to what that will do? So we're saying drag, tile.drag, it would drag the target, but if we set, oh, sorry. True. <laughs> Any guesses what that would do? <laughs> if we set the current target to true, that means it will, by default, drag the tile rather than the individual tiles inside. So it drags all the tiles, the whole tile. Tile is the container. And maybe we should have called it tiles. <laughs> so uh, there you go. We've got current target available as well in drag and we probably don't want that either. Just a drag, like so. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about containers as we explore in Zim Explore. We'll come on down right here. Uh, we can loop through a container saying tile.loop. Zim loop is amazing. It's not Zim lop. It is indeed Zim loop. So that's a method that we can apply to um, a container. We can also use the loop function. So slightly different, the loop zim loop function on an array, on an object literal, or on a number. So we could loop a number of times, or we could loop through everything in an array, or we could loop through everything in an associative array or a, an object literal. But this is the looping through a container. And they all work in a similar way, but they give you what you want.
If we're going to loop through a container, what we really want is each child of the container. So each time we loop, we're going to it, it, it will call a function, much like an event. Anytime an event happens, it calls in a function. It calls a function. Here, when we loop, it calls this function. And we're given, much like the event object, we're given an object here that we can use. The, the, well, a parameter, actually, we're given a bunch of parameters. The first one is, in this case, the object inside the container, the, the child of the container. So uh, that's a bunch of circles, so we'll just call it circle. So when we loop through the tiles, which has a bunch of circles, we're given the circle. The next parameter we're given is the index number, if we need it, we may as well collect it. Then we get the total and you know a couple other things. If we're looping through an array, the thing, the first thing we're given is the element of the array, then the index, then the total. If we're looping through an associative array or an object literal, we're given the uh, the property name. The next parameter is the property value, and then the index, and then the total, etc. Another nice thing about loop, before I forget, is we can also dot true here, and that would loop in reverse. So it's quite easy to loop in reverse as that parameter. <clears throat> Anytime you remove an object from a container, you should loop in reverse so the index numbers don't get mixed up. So tile.loop, or we could have used the zim function, and we could have said uh, loop through tile. Uh, that would be the same thing. But if we're looping through a container, we've added loop as a method. Oh, come on. I seem to be missing my backspace or whatever I was looking to do there. OK, so uh, we are looping through the tile each time we're given a circle and an index if we so desire. So what can we do with that? Well, we can say, hey, circle dot radius. Let's change the radius of each one to a random number. Rand. So this is zim rand. It's uh, much like math dot random, except as you usually want, you want um, a couple numbers here. If I say random 10, it will give me between 0 and 10. If I say something like 10 to 50, it will give me a random number between 10 and 50. It's got some other neat things too. You can choose a, a negative range of that. You can choose integers only. So it's very handy. Now, we're going to loop and change the radius of the circle. Do we need to update the stage here? No, uh, we wouldn't really want to uh, update a stage in a loop. That would update each time when really you want to update the stage after. But we already have a stage update. So we're good. This happens in line right away. And then stage.update will happen later. The event, here earlier event, this doesn't happen right away. This happens when the user clicks. That's much later. So we would need to update the stage later. OK, so we're looping through and changing the radius. Let's see if we have a bunch of random uh, radii. Indeed, we do. <clears throat> So zim loop is extremely handy. We introduced it not too long ago, and about a year ago, and I've just used it constantly. No longer do we have to do that uh, ungainly for loop. The for var i equals zero to i is less than the num children of the loop, or tile dot num children i plus plus, and you always forget where you put the semicolons. And then inside, you have to say, okay, var circle is equal to uh, tile dot get child at i, you know, like ugh. So basically, zim loop just did all that for us without even thinking. How about we make an array? Var colors is equal to an array literal, and we can put in frame dot blue, frame dot pink, frame dot green, etc., etc., etc. So this is JavaScript, remember, of course. So there's a JavaScript array called colors. And then inside of here, we can say circle.color is equal to colors at i. Now that would almost work. When i is 0, we get blue. When i is 1, we get pink. When i is 2, we get that. But when i is 3, uh-oh, it go too far. 
So if we just percent three or percent colors to be more specific, colors dot length, uh, or more general maybe. <laughs> so if we change the length of co uh, the colors array now, this would still work. Or if we hard coded with three, it would not. So that will take the remainder. When we divide by three, in this case, it would be the remainder. So uh, the zero uh, is zero, one is one, two is two, three is back to zero. So it goes zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, over and over again for as many circles as there are in the tiles. So we save that and we refresh here. And now we've got blue, pink, green, blue, pink, green, blue, pink, green, etc. What if we wanted that to be random? Well, if we wanted it to be random, we could, um, here's a little trick, we could randomly get uh, a number between 0 and 3, but I guess that would be 0 to 2, so 0, 1, or 2, we could randomly get that with rand and, and get it that way. What I like to do if, if everything's just short like this, here's how to do it without thinking. Colors, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> without thinking, I said shuffle, so this is zim shuffle, shuffle, and uh, colors, and then get the first one. So uh, Zim, uh, we have a bunch of short, short functions uh, in the code mode uh, mo um, module. The Zim code module has a bunch of short functions that we call as functions. <clears throat> And that's like PHP kind of things that we've done over and over again. And we sort of, hey, let's simplify that. So these are the conveniences. So we can easily shuffle the array by just saying shuffle colors. Now, it's not a method of the array, so you can't go colors.shuffle. We could have done that, but we just decided not to play around with the, the actual JavaScript array, which is good practice. Uh, so we've got our own function, shuffle, and we pass in the array, and then we're getting the first one. Once we've shuffled the array, we'll just get the first one. And this will give us random colors. So if we refresh here, now you can see, hey, here's a couple of blue ones next to one another. So these are random colors this time. Okay. Now you might be saying, I can already see a puzzle. Oh, let's grab all these together, you know, and if they hit and they're the right colors, we get a bigger circle. Remember that kind of game or, you know, whatever. So, uh, great. You might be looking at this going, oh, but what if I was already using RAND somewhere else? Or what if some other library uses RAND or Shuffle? Might there be a conflict? Yes, there might. And so with Zim, you've got the Zim namespace as well that you can use. Zim.shuffle, Zim.rand. We would make a, uh, a new Zim.tile, etc. And then come all the way up to the, we're exploring, all the way up here. What is this? Ooh, ZNS. It stands for Zim namespace. So right now we don't need to use the Zim namespace, which means Zim will make global functions of all of its functions and classes. So, you know, if you don't want that uh, because you're using other libraries and there could be a conflict, you're welcome to set this to true. So if you set that to true, that requires the namespace and Zim will no longer make global functions of all of its uh, functions and, and classes. Okay, uh, but I would say that 95% of the time, maybe even more, Zim is a you know a single page app. We're we're doing everything in Zim and CreateJS, and we can handle not not uh, conflicting with CreateJS. Don't worry about that. Okay, so uh, that's the case. Now that's not to say that Zim can't be put in a web page with other things as well. It can certainly easily uh, be be done using the scaling options. We say the tag ID, so that if you make a div with an ID, you can then um, have Zim scale to that tag, like be put right into that tag. All right. At which point, if you think there's going to be a risk of any any um, conflict, then you can set that to true and always use zim dot, zim dot, zim dot all the way through. But we've simplified that for us uh, for the most part. That's false 
and we no longer need to say new zim circle or new zim tile. No, we don't need that. Oh, by the way, that would work just fine. If you put the zim namespace there, you're welcome to use it, even if it's turned off to false. But uh, that's it. All right, I think that's a great place to leave the explorations. Oh, isn't that exciting? We've um, taken a look at some explorations. Oh, nice, huh? Mm -hmm. Zim Explore. Yes. And I don't know what we're going to take a look at when we explore next, but I'm sure it will be something fun. If you like this, you're welcome to hit that like button. Nobody hits the like button. <laughs> Uh, maybe we need somebody like uh, Fiverr to you know come through and give us a hundred likes for five dollars. Uh, oh, whoa, whoa! Uh, and pop on by ZimJS.com, try it out yourself. And things like Zim Zoo and uh, Zim badges and all that kind of stuff. Tell your friends and tell the world. Yes, be friends with the world too. That sounds good. I am Doctor Abstract here at Zim. Ciao.